Any group of people is, that is unified by some commonality, interest, what have you, needs to have the well-being of the group dynamic and the well-being of individual relationships as their priority. Otherwise, the group really isn't unified in anything and the relationships fall apart. There really is no group. There really are no relationships. It really just kind of boils down to, you know, I and me, me, myself, and I. Uh, for example, maybe you've been in a band, uh, or maybe you've seen documentaries or read biographies or watched something on VH1 about a band, right? And it, usually the bands start off in good shape. Their, their focus, their goal is the music. Their, their goal is, is they're about the band. A good band really serves the song. They're, they're about putting the music out there. But what happens in, at some point eventually is... Uh, one person or maybe a cluster of people in the band sort of start to think, well, I'm the talent, we're the talent, we're the musicians, we're the songwriters, and everyone else is just sort of riding on our coattails, and the group dynamic goes away, and individual relationships are broken, and it becomes, well, something to watch on VH1, I suppose, um, behind the music or something like that. Um, maybe you've seen it in sports. It should be about the team, right? It should be about making other people look good. It should be about about doing your role, doing your job, playing your position well so that the rest of the team looks good. But what can happen is somebody becomes a superstar, somebody becomes a hero, or, or and it goes to their head and they think they're the main event and it's no longer about the game or the team, it's just about them. It's bad news. Surprisingly enough, this also happens in churches. I know, shock, right? Surprise, surprise. Any, any group situation, this can happen. Uh, there have been books written about this idea, this concept. Um, where sometimes it, become, it can become about the pastor, or it can become about, in some cases, the worship leader. And sometimes people start saying, well, you know, you worship leader, you're so great. And there's this contention that begins between the pastor and the worship leader, and, or the youth pastors, or, or maybe it's a person in the church who thinks, well, you know, I could do this job better. I could run this church better. And it becomes just icky, messy. It's no longer about the group. Relationships break down. And um, it's basically just yucky. <laughs> That's kind of the word for it. Wherever there is a group, there's the potential for division. And we could spend hours talking about why and how that happens. But basically, it boils down to pride, right? It becomes about an individual or a small group of people who begin to say, I know better. I, I can do better than that. In fact, I am better. In all of my glory, I am better. I am goodlier. Um, that's right. <laughs> um, and in, sometimes this is even done through good intentions, especially in a church. It's like, well, you know, I, th I think we can do this thing better than those people are doing it. And that's a good intention, but it becomes this divisive ugliness. There are ways to pursue those things. And as a church, as believers, we are called to something more. We are called to something higher as we live. And maybe you've heard these terms in Bible speech as we live in one accord, right? And I'm not talking about a Honda. <laughs> it's not a clown car. And I was thinking through, I was like, I think I've, in my career, I've owned uh, three Civics, one Accord and one um, Odyssey. So I'm, I'm a fan of Hanas, and not, it's living in, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, it means, you know, when you read the beginning of Acts, it said they were in the upper room in one accord. It means they were in harmony. They were unified. There, was, there is a group level to this, living in one accord. There's also living with one another. Jesus talks about the phrase, love one another. So there's one accord living, and there's also one another living. And as a church, we are called to that kind of living. We are called to, you could Label it as love-bound living. Love is the element that ties together, that binds together. It's, it's like a rope and you wrap something up and you tie it all together. Love-bound living. That's what it is we are all called to. Well, what does that mean? And what, is, what does that look like? It means fostering or encouraging or supporting or in some otherwise making it happen, and fostering the things that promote living in one accord. And it means doing everything on behalf of Jesus while living with one another. 
It means fostering the things that promote living in one accord and doing everything on behalf of Jesus while living with one another. The Colossian believers were rife with division. They had both spiritual division and cultural division. The spiritual division, they had the, the Gnostics who had the special knowledge. We know how to do things better. We have the, the secret stuff. And the legalistic Judaizers who say, no, you have to do these things first in order to earn God's love and to be righteous before him. And there was just lots of division. Um, Paul has been pointing out that pointing these things out and pointing out the correct way of thinking. He's trying to correct their mindsets in order to correct their actions. And now he's going to tell them what love-bound living looks like, the kind of living that we are called to today. And he's going to do that by dishing out some directives that they need to implement and we all, excuse me, need to implement. So let's read uh, the, the part we're going to go over today and uh, we'll go back and take a look. Colossians 3.12 says this, Therefore... As the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. But above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be, excuse me, do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bondservants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men-pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But as he who does... Excuse me, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying for us also that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be grace, excuse me, be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Quite a difference, isn't it? Quite a, <laughs> Paul's finally saying, this is what it looks like when your feet hit the street. This is, these are some practical ways to do all of this stuff. We've been talking about systemic Christianity. Systemic meaning that it affects everything in your life. And here is where Paul finally says, we've corrected all this mindset. We've said, you guys started well. You need to be dedicated to the task like we have been. Now we're in jail for it, but that's a good thing because it's bearing fruit. Uh, you guys have been trying to dig a hole full. You've recognized that there's an incompleteness. There's no peace in your lives because you're trying to fill this hole while digging another hole in your life. And that's obviously not working out for you. In other words, don't do it like that. Do it like this. You've been raised with Christ because you died in him. And, and now you need to not do it like that anymore. Start doing it like this. And here he says, you guys need to live, have love bound living. Let that be the thing that ties you together. In other words, systemic Christianity means fostering the things that promote living in one accord and doing all on behalf of Jesus while living with one another. Well, how do we do that? Well, again, by implementing these directives. The first one relates to one accord living. Go ahead and hit the slide. Uh, basically, put on attributes that break down barriers and build up the body. That's the first thing we get into here in verse 3. 
excuse me, verse 12 of chapter 3. Paul says, therefore, as the elect of God, he points out who they are. This is you guys. You guys are the elect of God. The word elect means chosen. You were the chosen of God. The Gnostics said you had to, you know, beat your flesh and, and make it suffer because it's bad and you will be rewarded in heaven. And the legalists said, no, you have to go through these rituals and you have to live this way to earn, to be righteous before God. And Paul says, you guys are the chosen. You're, you're elect. It's something that has been done to you. It's not something you had to do. You're the elect of God. You are holy, is the next thing he describes them as. Holy means set apart, a dedicated thing. That's what we are. I don't know if you've ever thought about yourself that way. But you are a dedicated thing by God. You have those things that are set apart for special uses. That's you. That's me. We are the elect. We are holy, not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done. And that continues with the next word, beloved. As the elect of God, holy, set apart, beloved. This is that agape love. This is that love that is completely given over to. And this word, this word uh, as beloved, it's, it's something you are now, but it's you are this way now because of, what if, because of what has happened in the past. And it's not something you have done in the past. It's something that God has done in the past. You are beloved, not because of what you have done, but because of what he has done. You get that? That's the deal. You are loved, not because you, you know, look what I can do. And God said, okay, that's good. No, it's just you are because he has chosen to. His actions. He says, therefore, as the elect... Because you are the elect, because you are holy, because you are beloved. Here's what I want you to do. Here's my command. Here's my directive. Put on. And he gives a list. And we've seen this before, haven't we, in our study? It's this, the word literally means like you put on clothes. Dress yourself. Put these things on. Wear these things. Cover yourself in these things. And he gives us this beautiful little list. Put on tender mercies. Now, one way that you could literally translate these two words would be bowels of compassion. That is not pretty at all to me. Tender mercies sounds better, but that's, it means um, maybe a more friendly way to put it would be have a soft spot, right? Maybe you have a tender spot, a soft spot in your heart for something. Paul says, put on those soft spots. Don't you know, be our, all hard and calloused, have this compassion that comes from a soft place in you. Because legalism and self-proclaimed spirituality do the opposite, don't they? They separate, they do, how about crustify? <laughs> they do put this crust around you, this wall, this toughness. And Paul says, no, put on, you've put off the old man, put on the new man, put on tender mercies. Have a soft spot. He says, put on kindness. Now, this word for kindness is not so much acts of kindness, but an attitude of kindness. It's not, he's not commanding them to do kind things as he is. Just have a kind attitude toward one another. He says, meekness. This is a great word. It's not, meekness is not weakness. That's the way to remember this. It is not weakness. Meekness um, is, well, let me show you a picture of meekness. Literally, a picture. <laughs> this is Andre the Giant. How many of you remember Andre the Giant? In fact, the picture on the left was taken here in Portland at the old Portland Sports Arena that's not there anymore of Portland Wrestling. Uh, that's Jimmy Superfly Snooker. This is a long time ago. Um, but on the right, maybe you're more familiar with Andre in the role of, uh, what's his name, Fezig in The Princess Bride. He is meek. He is huge. He is powerful, but he doesn't fly off the handle and destroy. Anybody want a peanut? No, he's not doing that all the time. <laughs> he is a picture of what this word meekness means. Uh, one, Aristotle used, described this word as being, it's the middle ground between getting angry for no reason and never getting angry ever. It's power that is controlled. It's the opposite of meekness would be revenge, right? So meekness is there's that strength and that power there, but it's not flying off the handle and it's not laying dormant. It's, it's just steady. It's present. 
So when you see meekness, Jesus says, blessed are the meek, blessed are the Andre the giant. That's, that's what he's trying to communicate. And that's what we need to be to one another. We can't just be flying off a handle all the time, nor can we just be passively blah all the time. We need to be controlled. We need to be disciplined in that way. Um, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, put on long suffering. We've seen this word too. Uh, the, the difference between long suffering and patience is that long suffering has to do with patience with people and patience has to do with circumstances. So he says, put on long suffering. So all of these words have to do with living in one accord, don't they? It's an attitude of peace. It's an attitude of getting along. It's an attitude of softness toward or with one another. Um, and the Gnosticism and the legalism just squish that. He says, no, put these things back on. Verse 13, he says, bearing with one another. Another translation says, put up with one another. I like that better because that's what this word means. <laughs> it just means be patient, put up with one another. Maybe a word picture would be if you have two people leaning back to back and one of them is leaning a little harder, well, you have to be the one who puts up with that pushing a little harder. You're the one supporting them in a way. They want to push hard on you maybe, but it's like, okay, I'm not going to fight back, but I am going to rest here and put up with you, help prop you up, okay? Bearing with one another, putting up with one another, and forgiving one another. Oh my goodness, forgiving. That's easy. No problem. I forget. The way I forgive you is I never see you again. So that's easy. No, that's not true either, is it? Um, forgiving. Another word, uh, uh, an improper, <laughs> that was going to be a self-funny statement. The way to say this word wrong, I don't know, would be uh, gracing. Like if you could take the word grace and use it as a verb, this would be gracing, forgiving one another, gracing one another. Um, it means to hand over something, to let something go freely and voluntarily. And that's what it means to forgive. You're hanging on to something and you have to say, okay, I'm not going to hang on to this anymore. That's what Jesus did for us, right? That's what God did for us. He had plenty to hang on to as far as we are concerned in our relationship with him. But when we come to him and say, God, forgive me, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So to forgive means to let go. And Paul is telling these believers, in your legalism, in your spirituality, maybe you've offended one another, forgive. If anyone has a complaint against another, that's why there is a need to forgive. To have a complaint against someone means... You want to blame someone else for something else. He says, don't do that. You know, beginning now and in the future, don't hold on to these complaints. Why? Well, because as Christ forgave you, as Christ graced you, continuing to use grace as a verb, so you also must do. Jesus did this for you guys, then you need to forgive one another. Yeah, but they hurt me and they owe me and there's the righteousness. And Paul, no, Jesus took that all took all of that. He took it out upon himself. So we need to forgive, let go of these things to one another. Not an easy thing to do, but that's what Paul says to do. Um, so if you're hanging on to stuff, that's something between you and the Lord, or maybe you need to talk to somebody about that, but you need to let these things go because the more you're hanging on to stuff, the less arms you have to reach out and help other people serve other people, and support other people. That's just, that's the connection. The next thing Paul says to put on in verse 14, he says, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Put on, again, it's a command, it's a directive. He says, put on love. Now, I, I mentioned this word love a second ago. This word love, this agape love, uh, people will define as this is God's love, and that's certainly true. It is God's love, but um, Jesus himself uses it with men loving darkness rather than light. So it's not exclusively God's love. Rather, it's a love that is given over to, a love that is completely given over to someone, something else. So I 
picture when Jesus says, men have loved darkness rather than light. If you've ever known an addict, you know that they love the thing to which they are addicted. Their life is given over to that thing, completely motivated by that thing. Everything else in their life revolves around that, especially a, a drug addict. As all the money goes to the drug, all the time goes to the drug, they work so they can pay for the drugs. That's, that's what their, their world is about. And that's what, as odd as it sounds, that's what agape love is. That's the kind of love Jesus has for us, a love that was completely given over to his life on this earth and continuing today in heaven as he intercedes for us is completely given over to us. Paul says, you are the elect of God, you are holy, you are beloved like that. And now he says, put on love. Wear love so that it can be visible, so that it can shine, so that people can see it, which is the bond of perfection. Um, for this word for per- perfection is, is kind of cool. It's, um, uh, it means, simply means that which binds together. If you tie something up with a band, it means referring to a ligament in your body that connects or binds together bones and muscles and, and all that, whatever ligaments connect. Um, it's super glue. It's that which causes things to stick together. It means completeness. It means when you have a project that you have finished, it is perfected. It's complete. It's done. It's the state of being done. When Jesus said it is finished on the cross, this word for perfection is related to that. It's, it's finished. It's done. It's complete. Love is the bond that makes complete, that binds together. It's, um, it's the bow on a present. My aunt is the best at putting bows on presents because you cannot take those suckers off. I don't know how she does it. They're, they're like, they're atomically bonded to tides. It's just, you gotta like get a chainsaw and cut these things apart. Um, but that's what love is. It's the bow, it's the, it's the ribbon on the present. It's, it's the belt that ties the whole ensemble together. It's, uh, <laughs> it's the duct tape that holds the project together. Um, without it, we are incomplete. Without it, we are dysfunctional, disconnected parts. Without it, we fall apart. Love is the bond of perfection. And without wearing that, we simply fall apart. We don't function. So this is the uniform, okay? Or for the ladies, maybe the outfit. Um, this is the uniform or outfit of those who are God's elect, who are his holy ones, his beloved ones. That is us, and not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done. So how does your uniform look? How does your outfit look? How's your ensemble doing? How did, I mean, if God were to do some kind of inspection, and he says, okay, let's line up. How are we doing? And it's, that sounds a little over the top, but that's kind of the idea. If you were to take a step back from yourself and say, okay, what am I wearing? What have I, what have my, what have I put on? Am I wearing tender mercies? Am I wearing um, meekness? Am I wearing these things, long-suffering? Is it evident? Is it visible? Is, it has to do with this one accord living. How does yours look? Paul says to put off the old stuff and put on the new. Well, where do you get this stuff? Well, you get it from the Holy Spirit, and it's all free. It's like there's a Holy Spirit store that you can go into and say, I want this and I want this and I'm going to try it. I don't have to try it on. It fits perfectly because it was made for me. There's no re- reason for those try-on rooms that I hate those try-on rooms. <laughs> um, anyway, it's a phobia I won't get into now. But um, it comes from him. He equips us. He fills us. He clothes us. We, we put those things on via the Holy Spirit. So to foster living in one accord means to put on these attributes that break down barriers because you can't have barriers where there's, you're wearing tender mercies and love and all this stuff. It breaks down barriers and they build up the body. Put these things on. That's how you experience love-bound living. The next directive Paul gives us to implement that has to do with one accord living is this. Let the peace of God be the referee of your individual and collective lives. Slide, please. Let the peace of God be the referee of your individual and your collective lives. Verse 15. 
Paul says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. This word for rule, it's let rule. That's the command. Let rule the peace of God in your hearts. It's a, it's a directive. It's an imperative. Paul says, do this. And for this word for rule isn't so much like a governor or a king or something like that. It literally means an umpire or a judge in the Olympic Games who rules, who makes the judgments, who enforces the rules, who makes the final decisions. So when you watch a football game or a basketball game and there's the referee and he sees an infraction, he throws the flag and says, here's the ruling on the field, right? He is enforcing the rules. He is making the calls. He is keeping the game going. Paul says, let the peace of God rule In your hearts, let it be the referee. Now contrast that to chapter 2, verse 18. We saw this same picture there as well. Paul says, let no one cheat you of your reward. That word for cheat means uh, an umpire or referee who makes a call, and the call that is made happens to be against you, works not in your favor. Paul says, don't let anybody cheat you out of these things. But here he says, let peace rule. Let it be the judge. Let it make the calls. Let it drive everything. Um, Paul is using this sports metaphor. So let's extend it. He says, let, uh, well, I just got ahead of myself. To which also you were called in one body. This word for called means invited. Paul called you. He said, you know, hey, Brian. Hey, Jonah. Hey, everybody. Hey, Jackie. He called. That's what it is. He called out. He tried to get your attention so that you would hear and respond. We have been called to this thing. So if the peace of God is to be the ref and we've been invited, let's extend this sports metaphor that Paul himself is painting. It's as though there's this game going on in a field and we are walking by or maybe you're riding by on your bike, however you want to picture yourself doing that. And um, the coach sees you and calls you and says, hey, come over here. We need a player. I want you to go to right field. Because that's where the really not so good, that's where I played. That's where the guy goes who doesn't know what to do, which is me. Um, You are now part of a team, right? Because you have been called and you have been put in a position. And you are now part of that one body, as it were. That's what Paul is talking about. And as one body, we have one heart. And we are called collectively to let the peace of God rule in that heart. So there's lots of, you know, you can read this and make this individual, but really Paul is talking to them as a collective, as a group, as a church, as a body. He's saying, let the peace of God rule in the heart of that body. So as one body, we have that one heart. And remember the divisions and the diversity and the, the yuck that was going on? Paul says, be thankful. This is also a command. Be, be in a state of continually being thankful, which is in contrast to the complaint against one another. Keep on always being thankful. So to promote this one accord living, Paul says, let the peace of God be the ref of your individual and collective lives. Is that true for you? Is it true for us as a body? I hope so. We're trying to achieve, if not maintain, that, but for you and your family, maybe as a collective, as you're just you and Jesus in your own life, who is the ref? Who is making the calls? Who has the say? Who makes the rulings? See, the internal conflict that we experience as believers, as individuals, is the result of us taking the hat and the whistle from the Holy Spirit, who is supposed to be the ref, the peace, who is supposed to be the ref, and we put it on ourselves and we say, I'm in charge. Penalty. Against who? Against God. Why? Because I'm not happy. That's a flesh thing. That's when we try to assume that role, that's when things get really ugly. He is supposed to be in that position. (sighs) On a body level, it becomes a power play between people, and we are directed, directed, commanded to let the peace of God rule, be in charge. So, To foster living in one accord means to let the peace of God be the ref of your individual and collective lives. That is how we experience love-bound living. But wait, there's more. To, again, 
encourage one accord living, Paul tells us to make yourselves the home of the word of Christ. Next slide, please. The home where the action is. Make yourselves the home of the word of Christ, the home where the action is. Verse 16, Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So the command here is let dwell. Let dwell in you the word of Christ richly. It means, you know, to inhabit. It means to to live in something. So let dwell in who? In what? You, the body. Again, you could say individually, but this is Paul talking to a group. So let you, as a, as a body, as a group of people, let dwell in you what? This word of Christ. What is this word of Christ? Some people will say, well, it's the gospel. It's, it's the message. And that's probably true too. Other people say it's, it's everything Jesus said. You know what? I think it's all of that. Just let his word, let the word of Christ, the, the logos of Christ. You could go back to John 1.1 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That's, that's this same word for word here. Word? Word. word. All right. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Richly means if you go to somebody's house who's re- a really nice, you know, a rich person, or maybe it's a museum, I don't know. You go to like um, uh, Piddock Mansion, you guys been up there? It has all this like really, it was a rich house and really nice stuff. When you, it's, it's furnished richly. That's what it is. It's, there's nice stuff around, stuff that you're afraid to touch because it's like a museum. Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you like that. Like you're in a really nice house and there's really nice stuff everywhere. Let it dwell, let it fill you like that. I think it's a pretty cool picture. Um, so it's like we're a house with rooms and places. And so let's kind of carry on that picture. Paul says, let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom and teaching. I think there should be an and between wisdom and teaching. Those two should go together. So if the word of Christ dwells in us richly in all wisdom and teaching, that's kind of like the library or the study of your house, right? It's very intellectual. It's wisdom is, well, it's wisdom. Um, Teaching is that it's that instruction. So there's, there's again, there's kind of an intellectual component to it. Um, if you want to turn a couple pages to the right to Second Timothy, uh, two, Paul talks about the word. Second um, Timothy two fifteen, Paul says, "Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth." And your translation might say. Uh, study to show yourself approved or, or something along those lines. We need to get the word of God into us, right? It's actively pursue, let it dwell, let it fill. Go to chapter three, verse 16. Paul says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's good for you. It's beneficial for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let it dwell in you richly. Get it into you. Wisdom, teaching, studying, input. That's what he's talking about. And then he says, uh, where did I, oh, there it is. Admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Admonishing means, it's not, it sounds negative, doesn't it? It's not This word is not exclusively negative. It means, it can mean correcting, but it can also just mean instructing, admonishing one another, instructing one another, teaching one another, you could say, but it's more more so um, instruction. In what? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is like the music room in your house. Some people use their garage or some room and they have like, oh, there's a drum set and guitar and keyboards and all that stuff. This is that room. Except it's not just for making a lot of noise. It's for making songs that do what? Instruct. Instruct one another with songs. We use today, we use songs as teaching schools, teaching teaching tools. (laughs) I can't read and talk at the same time. It's not always an easy thing. Um, Because, well, then, particularly, people were literate, but not like today. So in order to teach people things, you would put things in song, which is we do a similar thing today. We, do the, we have the ABC song, right? Every te- little kids learn the ABC song. A, B, C, D. It's, you know, it's Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Which, by the way, was written by Mozart at the age of four. 
Weird, huh? A four-year-old kid writes this melody, and now we use it to teach our kids the alphabet. But that's a teaching song, isn't it? Amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. That's instructive. That's theology. That's sanctification. That's justification. That's, uh, that's soteriology. It's all. That's heavy duty. Just that one stanza. That's this admonishing. That's this teaching. That's this, um, it's all of that. Um, very profound song, but much less profound song. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. That's a cool song. Just the substance of the song. That's Jesus saying you have a spring of living water flowing out of you. That's instructive. That's an important thing to learn. Probably one of the most profound and simple ones is Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. That's instructive. That's admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This has a creative, this is a creative demonstration of the word of God dwelling richly. And then he says, singing with grace in your hearts, to the Lord. Singing with grace. It's a joyfulness. It's a gratitude. That's what this singing with grace is. Uh, it's, you know, you could say it's your general state of being as you go through your entire house. You're walking around your house that we're using here in this picture, just singing with grace in your heart, with joyfulness, with thankfulness. It's, it's uh, our kids walk around our house singing. It's usually like susical songs and Stuff like that, but uh, at least it was. It's whatever musical they're working on now, but you can walk around the house singing, I've got a river of life. You can walk around the house singing, Jesus loves me, or Amazing Grace, and you can have that just always in you. And in a church, that's the same thing. This is, again, to a body of people singing these songs to one another. Now, notice the balance. See, that was a demonstration of the word dwelling richly, an emotional demonstration. See, there, it's okay to be emotional. I'm like, you know, the Vulcan pastor. I could, I could, that's what I could, I could just do that. I could be on Star Trek and be the Vulcan Christian and be like very stiff, very rigid. I'm not that expressive, but um, there needs to be an emotional element and it's, that's, that's okay to be. But I was looking at this and notice the three sort of components. There's an intellectual, the wisdom and the teaching. There's a creative singing, admonishing one another in song. And there's an emotional dynamic that's singing with grace in your hearts. And as individuals, we might be stronger in one of them. Some people are really strong at the emotional demonstration and not so much as maybe the intellectual. Uh, you know, take your pick of combinations. And even as a church, churches can be really strong in one dynamic of this, but weaker in the others. And it's really important to try to find a balance. And what happens, can happen, is that you know, a, strong, a church that's maybe strong in one area has visitors or new people come who are stronger in a different area and they're all, well, they're all like that, and we're all like this, so we can't function here. We're going to go somewhere else. It's like, no, we need you to provide the balance. It's okay to be different in these areas. Um, that's just how it's supposed to be. Our house, our house, God's house, this body, should be known for being a house where all the action is. They have the music room. They have the cool library. They have, they have, they're all walking around singing these songs. And I'm not talking literally about our library at the office or that we have great musicians so much, although that's part of it. It's just, we should be that house. You know, oh, I love going to Billy's house because his mom makes the coolest treats. I love going to, to Fred's house because they have the really cool uh, entertainment center, the big like 80 inch screen and we can sit in the rumble chairs and play our game. You know, that's kind of how we see it. As, at least as kids, that's how we saw other houses. Our house should be that house, the house where the action is. Let the word of Christ dwell, live in you, inhabit you richly. Well, how do you do that? By getting the word into us on our own, individually, we need to do that. And as a group, we do that. We're doing that right now. But it has to come in. Otherwise, it can't flow out. Um, you can do it by coming up with creative ways or acquiring creative ways to learn and express God's word. Uh, you can make up your own scripture memory songs that maybe you don't sing for anybody else. I don't know, but they help you 
Maybe you're creative like that and you can do that. And maybe share that with other people so they can grow from that. You can do it by letting it have an emotional impact on you, an emotional influence like it's supposed to have because this comes from a living being. This comes from a God who has feelings and is himself emotional. So it should have an emotional impact on us. You don't, should, there will be times when you can read it and go, that's, that's kind of cool, I didn't know that before. There should be other times when you read it and go, oh, I'm broken. That is, it just has this deep emotional touch, whether it be humility or thanksgiving or something, but it should inspire something like that. And we need to let that happen. To foster living in one accord means to make yourself the home of the word of Christ, the home where the action is. That is how you experience love-bound living. Now, these verses we've gone to so far have had to do with the body, the community of believers, the one accord, in one accord, living. The next set of verses, Paul switches gears to a more one another, to more individual relationships, but it's still very, very important. Paul lays out the directive and then gives examples of what it looks like. So the directive is found in verse 17. This is the one another, this sort of encapsulates it all. Paul says this. Well, here's my version of it. Do everything on behalf of Jesus, giving thanks to God as you do it. Do everything giving thanks to Jesus. Paul says in verse 17, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And whatever you do, literally, it means, and everything that anything if you do. Doesn't make sense to us, but that's what it is in Greek. And everything that anything, if you do. That pretty much covers it all, doesn't it? Anything and everything. In word or in deed, the things that you say and the things that you do or make or perform. Do it all in the name of. This means in the authority of or on behalf of. You know, when you would, you know, in the name of the king, I command you to blah, blah, whatever. You know, that's, you remember those pictures from movies or storybooks? Someone comes in the name of someone else and says, in the name of the governor, in the name of so-and-so, I am here. I have their authority. I'm doing it on their behalf. Paul says, everything you do in word or in deed, do it on behalf of or in the authority of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks, and that is a command in the language, that's an imperative, giving thanks, give thanks, always be in a state of giving thanks to God the Father through him. So everything you do, you should be able to do it giving thanks to God while you do it, and also doing it in such a way that it reflects well on him. That is systemic Christianity. That's it. That encapsulates it right there. So let's do that, shall we? So just go do it. Just, you, you know what I'm talking about. Just, you know, no, Paul's going to tell us what that means. Um, what does it mean? Well, let's turn it into a question. Let's take this command and flip it around into a question that we can say, I'm going to look at my life through this question goggles and see how it lines up. If we were to make this into a question, it would be something like this. As I do, fill in the blank, for someone else or for myself, as I say fill in the blank, to someone else, can I give thanks to God the Father at the same time? Can I do or say so with Jesus' authority or on his behalf? Or how does this, what I'm saying and what I'm doing, how does that reflect on him? Oh, snap. And you will say, oh, snap, as you begin to look at the examples that Paul gives. I think verse 17 belongs with this next list, not so much what came before it. And your Bible probably has a break after verse 17. I think Paul makes a transition. And whatever you do, he's about to talk about things that we do. So let's look at the various ways that he implements this. Uh, Verses 18, 19, 20, and 21 are all about marriage and family. And remember, this is a do all, all right? He says to the wives first, uh, submit. Here we go. I'm going to let you fight for a little while. No. Um, He talks to husbands too. Let's just calm down about this, shall we? Okay. This is an imperative command in this instance. 
This is an organizational term, not a qualitative term. I want to emphasize that. This is an organizational term, not a qualitative or a value term. It's a question of roles in relationships. Okay? Men and women, biblically speaking, are of equal value. In Christ, there is no difference. And Paul gives several variations. We saw one back in verse 11 about circumcised, uncircumcised, Greek or not, Jewish or not, slave, free, doesn't matter. In another place, he talks about men or women, slave or free. There's no difference. Paul made men and women of equal value, but he also created an organizational structure. Okay? That's really all that this boils down to. And there was apparently a problem going on where wives were not submitting to their own husbands. They were apparently maybe trying to submit themselves to other people's husbands. So he tells them, wives, submit to, cooperate with, assume the proper role in your marriage with your own husband. And he says, as is fitting in the Lord. Now, I'm going to go on to husbands, and we'll tie these two together. Husbands love. Again, that is the directive. That is a command. It's the same word we've already seen, agape. Husbands, be completely given over to your wives. And do not be bitter. Do not be bitter is also a command toward, do not be bitter toward them. This word for bitter, um, it kind of has an interesting linguistic chain. It's, it's connected to a word that first means um, pointed, something that's pointy, okay? And then you take something that's pointy and you poke it at something. What does it do? It penetrates. And as a result of penetrating, what does that do? It causes pain. So this came to mean bitter in the sense of a figurative term, because if you taste something that's bitter, it's like something's poking at your tongue, right? Suck on a lemon. <laughs> Little guys like, <laughs> that's that's bitter, that's tart, that's... And he says, don't, husbands, don't be that way towards your wives. Don't do that. Um, oh, I lost my place. Um, husbands, love and don't be bitter toward. Okay. What was causing wives to submit to other men? That's, kind of, that's the context for wives. What was causing husbands to be bitter towards their wives. That is the issue that is in context. He's not laying down some chauvinistic man-woman thing. He's trying to correct the relationships that were messed up because of other things. He says, you guys, you need to be do all, everything in the authority of, in, in reflecting Jesus, giving thanks to him. What is going on here with husbands and wives? Are the husbands doing something to make the wives not be submitted? Are wives doing something to make the husbands be bitter? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? I don't know. But uh, exactly, that's what Paul goes on to say. He says, I don't care. His point is, you take care of you. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, if my wife would only just change this way, I would be so much better. My, my husband would just stop doing this. I would be okay. Paul says, baloney. You take care of you. Something is causing the wives not to submit. Something is causing the husbands. And it doesn't matter which is which. He tells them on each side to fix themselves, to take responsibilities for their own issues. It doesn't matter who did it first or which came first. Paul says, deal with it. Now, I recently watched a video and read a book. I'm reading a book, or I have read a book by Paul Tripp about marriage called What Did You Expect? And I'm watching the video series of it as well. And he does this great, um, paints this great picture. He tells, tells us basically to be responsible. We are responsible for what comes out of us. And he uses this thing with water. And he uses a water bottle, but I'll use this. And it's going to make a mess, but I don't care. Um, so I'm totally ripping this off from Paul Tripp. This is not my own idea. It's pretty cool, though. So I'm going to, here, watch this. You ready? I shook the glass, and water came out. Why did water come out of the glass cup? Because I shook it? Well, I did shake it, but that's not why it came out. It came out because there was water in it. When I shook it, water came out of it because water is what was in it. That's how we are. 
when we get shaken, when our marriages get shaken, whatever comes out of us is something that was already in us. Jesus says it like this, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Your husband does something to you and you run He didn't make that happen. That came out of you. Switch it around. Wives, husbands, same thing. Whenever the other one does something in a circumstance or says something and you come out with blah, that was already in you. Deal with your own stuff. Wives, submit to your own husbands. Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. If they would fix themselves, then I would be okay. Nuh-uh, because that stuff is still in you. Fix you. Let Jesus fix you. Remember, do all those things that you want to say that you have said as you say them to your spouse. Can you say them on behalf of Jesus? You're being a real witch. Can you say that on behalf of Jesus? Can you say that with his authority? You're being a real jerk. Can you say that on behalf of Jesus? Is, that, is he behind you going, yeah. <laughs> No, he's actually, he's not going like, yeah, he's going. <laughs> that's, right. that's, that's where he is. He's looking at you going, no, no, no. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. This word for obey is the command. Children, obey. That's a command from Paul. This word for obey, excuse me, means to you hear something, you pay attention to it, and you react accordingly. I had this in elementary school. Unless you were homeschooled, you probably didn't experience this. But in elementary school, we had fire drills. And the fire drill involves hearing a sound like, ah, ah, ah. And as soon as you hear that sound, you know you hear it. It gets your attention. And you know what to do. Get up, go by the door, single file, go out to the designated area, and you have now obeyed that sound. Paul says, children, obey your parents when you hear them. Pay attention to it and respond accordingly. Respond obediently. And he says, it is well-pleasing to God. This word for well-pleasing, the way I like to describe it is, it's as if God, you see, he sees you do this and he goes, ah, Parents do that too when children obey. They go, oh, thank you. It feels so much better now that you've done that. That's what it is. It's well-pleasing to God. And then he says, fathers, you could say parents, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. See how he's addressing everybody? Husbands, wives, children, parents. He's hitting them all. Fathers, do not provoke your children unless they become discouraged. This word for provoke, um, it means to stir to anger. Don't provoke them. Um, don't push them. And this can be deliberate or not provoke. Sounds like you're intentionally, and Paul, certainly we're not supposed to do that. But even by accident, we shouldn't provoke our kids. We shouldn't stir them to anger. You know, Don't motivate by discouragement alone. That can be easy to do, is you're doing this wrong, stop doing it wrong. You're always doing it wrong. It's like, well, you did it wrong, but here's how to do it right. You need both the discouragement from doing it wrong, but also the encouragement to do it right. You need both of those things. And he says, if you, don't, if you are provoking them, if you continually provoke them, parents, your children are going to become discouraged. And a kind of a word picture for this becoming discouraged is don't knock the wind out of their sails. That's what this word means. It has to do with wind, and it's, it's, it's a really cool picture. Don't knock the wind out of their sails. If we're constantly provoking, if we're constantly needling, and even with good intentions, it can just knock that wind out, and there's no motivation to go anywhere or do anything. And Paul says, don't do that. Children, obey your parents. Parents say, yeah. Paul says, parents, don't provoke your kids. The kids say, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, okay. It's both. Folks, parents, I have a challenge for you. Ask your kids if you do this to them. And be prepared for the answer, yes. Oh, snap. 
ask your kids if you do this and be prepared for a yes answer and then do something about it. If your method is provocation, you need to change your method. Now, kids, children, understand that what you perceive as having the wind knocked out of your sails could maybe just be you being immature. Maybe. Parents are like, yeah, that's all of it. No, I'm not saying all of it. I'm saying there's two sides to this. Parents can overly provoke and discourage. Children can be immature. And it's just always negative. And everything. It's, uh, both sides got to work together in this. This is a relationship issue. In your parenting, in your childrening, can you say everything you say on behalf of Jesus? Can you say it with thanksgiving to God as you do this? Kids, parents, both sides, can you do that? Do all on behalf of Jesus while living with one another in your marriage and in your family. That's how you experience love-bound living. Paul goes on to work relationships. Verse 22, he says, bond servants. Now, there were bond servants and there were masters in that time, and I'm not going to go into the whole thing. The Bible promotes slavery, and that's wrong. I'm not going to get into that because that's not what we're talking about here. Yes, there was slavery in that time in the very negative sense that we think of it today, but there was also simply working for other people on a permanent basis. You would sell yourself to someone, to another, to a family and say, I'm going to work for you my whole life. And the name for that was slave, bond servant, but it was a voluntary thing. So it's not all exclusively the evil stuff that we're used to in our own history. It was also a very, could be a very positive, just normal work environment. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Um, to a bond servant is one, you know, it's the, you hear the word bond, it's one who is, who is tied to, like I said, voluntarily, uh, or not. And that kind of reminded me of when I was a kid, we had a St. Bernard. St. Bernard. His name was Bluto. And I was, one of my jobs was to take him for a walk, and we lived right behind our house was a middle school that had a big football field and a track, and so I would take him up there. And we had, for some reason, I don't know if we were cheap or what, but we had a leash that was basically just a leather loop with the little hooky on the end, and you put your hand through it and you grab it and you're like this far from the dog's neck, and that's kind of cool for control. But when you're, you know, eight, it's like you're right there by the dog, and if he saw a bird at the other end of the field, <laughs> you're Indiana Jones under that car being drugged involuntarily. I was bound to him. <laughs> I was like, that's a bond servant right there. I was a bond slave to my dog's desire to catch the seagull. Um, but for today's context, we could just say employee, worker. That's, put it in that context in your head. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service. In other words, don't just do it when they're watching. Don't just, you know, be, have a good attitude and be a good worker only when the boss is watching um, as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Sincerity of heart means to be single-hearted. Does that make sense? You have one motivation. We tend to be double-hearted. It's like, I'm going to go to work, and I'll do a good job there, but really I'm all about something else. I'm all about home. I'm all about this other thing. You're doing this to get to that. Paul says, no, be single-hearted, simple-hearted, simple-minded. Just be, have one thing in mind, fearing God. Yes, you are supposed to be afraid of God, not in a permanent, constant state of terror, he might zap me, but, you know, respect the power. God is, one way to describe God is meek. He is like Andre the Giant. Could Andre the Giant sit on you and squish you? Yep. Yeah, he could. Ugh. But he wouldn't do that unless he had a right reason, and God is kind of the same way. You need to be like, ooh, Andre, you're huge. I'm a little afraid of you, but I know you're cool, and we're, we're cool, right? Okay. Kind of like that with God. God, Jesus himself says, fear him who can destroy body and soul. Jesus' own words about the Father. There needs to be that there, but it's not a constant state of terror. That's not what he's talking about. You know, fear God. And whatever you do, verse 23, do it heartily. Do it from your soul. Do it from that inside soft spot. Do it with everything that is in you as to the Lord and not to men. 
ouch. I don't know where you work. I've worked at places where it's like, oh, man, I don't like the person I'm working for, so I'm going to have to do this as though I'm doing it for God. And then that's what it needs to be. Do your job wherever you work as though God himself is your manager, your supervisor, the CEO, whatever, wherever you are in your workplace. Do it as though he were the boss. Um, tells them to obey it. Whatever you do, do it heartily. Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Now, wait a minute. Who gets the inheritance? Children do, right? Slaves don't get an inheritance. The kids do. So there's kind of this double thing going on. In Christ, we are the children, the sons, the daughters of God. But here on earth, we might be in a more, in a position where we feel like we're a slave or we, we work. He says, you're doing these things knowing instinctively that you will get an inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. So you may be working right now and you're like, I hate this, but I'm going to do it for Jesus and he's going to give me an inheritance and I'm so looking forward to that. And sometimes that can be the thing that gets you through the rough patches. But Verse 24, he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. You know, so if you're working for someone who is abusing you and taking advantage of you and, and ripping you off, he says, God's got it. He will take care of those injustices, and he doesn't show favoritism to anybody in any position. Masters, employers, bosses, chapter 4, verse 1, give your bondservants what is just and fair. Now, masters aren't usually givers. They're usually takers. But he's telling these masters, if you have someone who is one in your household as a slave who works for you, give them what is fair. Give them what is just. Give them what they deserve for the work they're doing, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. <laughs> oh, okay. It's not just my own little bubble here. I am actually working for him. Slave, you're working for him too? Oh, we work for the same guy. Cool. Awesome. That's kind of the, the fellowship that they were supposed to have for one another. Um, do all, like we've been saying, on behalf of Jesus, and including in your workplace, while living with one another in your work relationships. That's how you experience love-bound living. Paul goes on to talk about your prayer life. Verse 2, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Continue earnestly. It's related to the word persevere. Keep on keeping on. Persevere in prayer. Um, being vigilant. It means to be awake. You're, uh, you're alert. You're not asleep. You are, you're vigilant. Stay, <laughs> not just like sleeping through your prayer time, but, you know, ref refraining from sleep in your prayer. Don't get lazy about it. Don't get slothful about it. Um, in, in it with thanksgiving. It's interesting. It's at least three times Paul has said, do this with thanksgiving. I think there's an underlying message there that we tend, maybe we aren't thankful often enough for enough, but in all of these things, we are supposed to do them with thanksgiving. And he kind of gives a little aside. This is, you know, in context to a group of people, says, be vigilant in prayer, praying for us also that God would open to us a door that the word, for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ, to reveal Jesus to people, for, for which I am also in chains. That's why I'm in jail, because I'm preaching Jesus. That I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. So he says, while you guys are continuing earnestly in prayer, pray for us. And of course, you know, it's a couple thousand years too late to pray for Paul in jail. But you can pray for the word to go out. You can pray for the word to go out in your own life for crying out loud, as a missionary in the workplace, in your family, in your school. You can pray for the word to go out through this church. You can pray for the word to go out through a missions agency. You can still pray that way, like Paul requested, just for other people today. Nothing's stopping us from doing that. Um, is that part of your prayer life for yourself and for the church? You pray earnestly for the word to go out amongst us in your own life, doing all on behalf of Jesus while living with one another in your prayer life. Can you pray reflecting well on God, uh, giving thanks to him in his authority? That's how you experience love-bound living. And lastly, in your relationships with those outside the body. Paul says in verse 5, walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. 
Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. He says, walk. That's the imperative command. Paul loves using that word walk as a picture of life. Our lives should not be a stand all the time or a sit or a lay down. Lives are a walk. Action, motion, doing, stuff. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. Pay attention to the world around you, people. (laughs) That's kind of what he's saying. And this is something I have to say in our house from time to time. Um, People are watching. It's not like, oh, I'm afraid people are going to think badly of me. It's just walk wisely. Walk in such a way that uh, they're going to see you, those who are outside, redeeming the time. Buying back the time that would otherwise be wasted. Let your speech always be with grace. People, you ever listen to people in the grocery store online? Maybe it's just me. I just, I just, I, people are talking and you can't help but hear them sometimes. Um, <laughs> we were at my wife's 20th reunion and there were some loud talkers there. Like, yeah, that's an interesting life. You just hear it whether you wanted to hear it or not. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I heard you in line at the store and you were talking about this, but you're a Christian too? <laughs> oh, I guess I wasn't walking in wisdom, redeeming the time. I guess I wasn't letting my speech be with grace and seasoned with salt. There are relationships with people who are on the outside. Um, in other words, always be on. When I was yo-yo man, um, we were told, you know, to when you get out of the car, you are on. Meaning, you're not performing on, but like, you know, you step out of that car in the school parking lot, you are on walking your way into the, to the building, in the hallway to the office, in the office to the gymnasium or wherever. You're on. You are representing our company at all times because you have the shirt on and you have the gear and people can see, oh, you must be the guy here to do the thing. You are always on. And that was, that's what it was for me in that job. And that's what it is for us believers. We are always on. Like I've said before, there's never any free time in the life of a Christian. There's never any downtime. You are, you are, you are, you are always on. There's never an off for us. And that's what Paul's basically talking about doing all on behalf of Jesus while living with one another in your prayer life and with those outside the church. That's how you experience love-bound living.